Welcome to the world of material science. My name is Professor Bonnet. In this video, we will learn about other important types of electrochemical corrosion, under what conditions they occur and how they can be avoided. Surprisingly, microorganisms can also cause considerable damage to metallic materials, even to high alloy stainless steel. Once a biofilm has formed in which the microorganisms feel very comfortable, in a gel-like mass consisting of so-called exopolymers, manganese oxidizing bacteria, for example, can join in and set rapid corrosion in motion. These photos show a severe case of damage caused by microbiologically induced corrosion. In a wastewater treatment plant, the damage shown occurred after only half a year of use Despite the use of high-quality, high-alloy stainless steel, they used an X6CRNIMOTI1712-2 that is a stainless steel with sufficient chromium, with enough molybdenum to prevent pitting corrosion, and with additional titanium to stabilize the steel against intergranular corrosion. So how could this severe damage have occurred? Inside the pipe, the biofilm, one might even say the biocrust, became visible after cutting it open. In further investigations, the presence of manganese oxidizing bacteria was detected. What was actually tragic, however, was the coincidence of this aggressive biofilm with poorly executed welding work. In all welds made on site, clear tarnish was vis visible under the biofilm, indicating that welding had been carried out without forming gas. It was a combination of these circumstances that caused the devastating total failure. All pipes were eventually replaced with polyethylene pipes. The costs amount to 125,000 euro. Due to the geometric conditions created by the biofilm, crevice corrosion also occurred on the welding neck flanges in the case described above. Hydrogen sulfide, H2S, is considered a particularly aggressive medium in the chemical industry. If the chromium content is low, rapid and severe sulfidation can occur in an atmosphere containing H2S. That is to say, the iron reacts to form iron sulfide, Fe plus S reacts to FeS. If high stresses have occurred in the material during processing, which have not been relieved, for example, by suitable heat treatment, stress-induced intergranular corrosion can occur even at low chlorine concentrations of smaller than 20 mg per liter, even without major chromium depletion by carbides and or nitrites. This photograph shows a partial section of a tube from a shell and tube heat exchanger. The tubes were formed by cold working, which introduced such severe stresses into the material that even at high alloy X2CRNIMO1814-3 was prone to severe intergranular stress corrosion cracking, even though the tubes of the heat exchanger were only exposed to cooling water. In the mid-1980s, a tragic case of material failure due to stress corrosion cracking occurred at the Oster indoor swimming pool in Switzerland. Part of the pool ceiling came down while the pool was in operation, burying 12 people underneath. Here the swimming pool ceiling had been suspended with struts made of 1810 steel, an X5CRNI1810. Unfortunately, the design allowed the pool air to circulate through the suspended ceiling and some of the chlorinated air condensed on the struts. The combination of tension that was inevitably on the structure and the chlorinated atmosphere also led to early total failure of this material. But how can remedial action be taken in such cases? A clear correlation between nickel content and stress corrosion cracking suspectably was demonstrated. The results in this graph were obtained on samples with constant chromium content of 18% and variable nickel content. We see that the measured service life 
just passes through a minimum at a concentration of about 10%. This means that the typical 1810 steel with its generally good corrosion resistance is particularly susceptible to stress corrosion cracking. As an alternative for applications where cer certain stresses cannot be avoided and also a certain chlorine concentration is given in the medium, we can either work without nickel at all, thus obtaining a ferritic material, or we can significantly increase the nickel content to, for example, 40%. Vibration corrosion cracking is essentially based on the same mechanism as stress corrosion cracking. Vibra vibration stress causes deep incipient cracks with a high dislocation density at the crack tip. The corrosion attack in this case does not require a specific electrolyte. Even tap water can lead to a significant reduction in fatigue strength. Whereas for stress corrosion cracking a certain sensitivity of the alloy must be given, vibration corrosion cracking is possible with all metallic materials. Vibration corrosion cracking leads almost exclusively to transcrystalline cracks. The sensitivity to vibration corrosion cracking can be determined in so-called Wöhler curves. The stress amplitude under vibration stress is plotted against the number of vibration cycles. Vibration resistant materials run into saturation after a short drop, while other materials show a steady drop until failure. At high flow rates, even otherwise less aggressive media can cause corrosion damage. Through an initially more or less mechanically induced erosion of the passive layer and an additional shift in the chemical equilibrium through constant media exchange, damage can thus also occur to high alloy steel with a passive layer. In principle, any metallic material can be affected by erosion corrosion due to the material removal caused by high flow velocities and the associated turbulence. However, this effect is only pronounced in materials with a soft matrix, especially copper and copper alloys. In this picture, we see an affected pump impeller, which was made of bronze. After a short period of time, there is already very little left of the guide veins. Another interesting type of flow-induced corrosion is cavitation corrosion or cavitation erosion. This can occur in the case of gas bubbles in the medium. Under certain flow conditions, the gas bubbles can implode, resulting in short-term local flow velocities up to 500 meter per second. Once again, we need to recall the figure shown at the beginning of the first video on corrosion and that corrosion resistance is not only a material property, but from a variety of factors. Thus, we always need to consider the corrosion system. We have seen that there are noble and base materials and that various base materials can also protect themselves by forming a passive layer. But also processing of the material can cause a material change which eventually leads to corrosion damage. Then we saw how important the environmental conditions are for the corrosion resistance of a material. This includes operating temperature or also the pH value or chloride ion concentration of a liquid medium with which the material comes into contact. Only when we know the sum of this information can we make a definitive statement about whether or not a reaction will occur and uh, thus corrosion. Only then can we think about how to avoid corrosion by selecting a suitable material or by taking constructive uh, measures. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope to see you again at the next video where we will deal more intensively with non-ferrous metals for the first time.